Say a little. You say a little prayer in your head when you pour the tea. No, I do not. <laughs> uh, when I'm drinking the tea, though, it, it, I slow everything down. Mm-hmm. Um, I smell it first. I look at it, and then I take a quick sip, see how it tastes, see if I did it correctly or you know my version of correctly, and then I enjoy it. The super fantastic. Welcome to the Super Fantastic Show. I'm your host, Brendan Moore. I'm joined in this episode by my good friend, Alfonso Wright. Alfonso is the founder of BrooklynTea.com, a premium tea brand based out of Brooklyn, New York. And in this episode, he's going to answer all my crazy questions about tea, why we should be drinking it, and everything you want to know about it. Take a listen. So tell me why. Why is hojicha the pick of the morning? You chose hojicha chi. Hojicha tea. I don't know why you gotta use it. To bring and serve. I'm like, you gotta get a little effortate with it. But uh, hojicha tea is. Hojicha? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not necessary. <laughs> you know, just hojicha. All right, so it's a roasted green tea. Mm. Um, looks very brown in, in color. Um, it's a good morning tea because the roasted smell kind of uh, gives you that morning time freshness like mm-hmm. uh, the uh, coffee commercials you know uh, what was that Folgers yeah Folgers yeah. Uh-huh. commercials thank you yeah so that roasted smell just really wakes you up and then the taste is uh, mild and a little you know woody which mm-hmm. is very much like <clears throat> what people like in the morning for coffee so it's a very uh, if you don't want to do black tea because you don't want all the caffeine but you still want a good pick me up Hojicha is a really good choice okay Hojicha refreshing relaxing warming Roasted Japanese green tea, notes of fresh baked bread, mm-hmm. and roasted chestnuts. Where, where did you come up with this stuff, man? What? The, did you come up with these descriptions? The notes? Smell it. What do you smell? I don't think I smell bread. Should I smell bread? It's it's palatable. So, I guess, you, have you ever had fresh bread? You probably haven't had fresh bread. You know, really? You're, you're, gonna just, you're, you're, just... you're a city kid. <laughs> so, when you smell the dry leaves, you smell the wet leaves, and you smell the actual tea. Right. Um, you get different, you have the get different associations with the smells. Um, it may not smell exactly like you know your grandma's fresh sourdough bread, right? But it smells like you know baked oats. You know, it has that baked oat smell, or it might have that toasty smell from like a, a wow. from right out of a toaster. No, what are you smelling now? The caramel pure tea Pu- smells Pu- like caramel, right? So that's caramel puer, and there's caramel in it. Oh, there's caramel in it. Yeah, so it's pu'er, um, which is an aged, fermented uh, black tea. Uh-huh. Good for di- digestion and weight loss. From where? That's from China. Okay. A- and uh, caramel, little caramel pieces. So are the Chinese and Japanese tea communities in harmony or are they banging? Oh, they're all. So it's Taiwan, Sri Lanka, um, now Kenya's in the game, India, China, Japan. Um, they're, they're all fighting for supremacy, but they've all decided to do their own thing too, except for uh, there's, some, there's some overlaps. So Are they talking crap? Yeah, everyone says they have the best, yeah. right? Um, and a lot of, there's a lot of stealing too. So, uh, like, But it's stealing of the processes, not of the tea, because the tea's the same. Right. Well, the tea's the same, but then, you know, just like any plant, where it's grown, you get some characteristics. Right. So even as far as if it's grown in the mountains... It tends to be a little sweeter. Um, it's grown in shade. It's a little sweeter. Right. If it's grown in a hot place, it, it's more astringent, stronger, bolder flavors. Where in the West is a great growth area for tea? Is there a part in the United States or in Central America, South America that really has the, the similar climate that's needed? So people are trying some things. Um, there's a tea company in Mississippi that just started maybe three or four years ago. Mm. That's um, you know they have their, their they have like their first harvest. Was just like that this last spring, mm-hmm. um, but tea takes a while to cultivate both the plants and the process. Right. So I wouldn't expect any like major uh, production from them for a few more years. Okay. But they're starting now because you know it's just like uh, like prize rose plants. Um, they're those have been in someone's family for generations, and right. now they make you know now every year it's a prize rose. Is it is it like grapes? Where they're the same genetic plants and they're just, you know, kind of splicing. Taking the, it's the same, like, from what I understand about grapes, mm-hmm. in many cases, there's several strains, but they don't, like, re-genetically engineer them. They take a piece from the previous one mm-hmm. and then they move it. Exactly. The same thing here. Exactly. Okay. So, but there's a, so there's a, it's just like grapes and just like grapes. So if you take something from France and bring it to California, mm-hmm. even if it's the same grape plant, 
Right. Because the the soil in California and the water in California is different. You, if you even use the same process, the wine's going to taste different than the wine you would have in France. Right. So you have the same processor, the same plant, different soil, different water, slightly different product. Mm. The same thing with tea, and that's why there's so many varieties of them. You can have the, you can have a Chinese plant take it to Memphis, but since it's in Memphis now, it's not going to taste the same as that Chinese tea would in China. Right. Makes sense. Okay. Right. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not. Right. Was back to the drawing board. Hmm. Um, there's some really expensive tea that's called bug bitten tea. So it's no pesticides. And since the, when the bugs bite the tea leaves, it changes the flavor. And some people love that flavor. So because they have that kind, that bug in that place hmm. with that soil, you have this special taste of this tea that you can't get anywhere else. Right. So <clears throat> you've done a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And you've chosen tea. Yes. What was the, what was the light on moment like? Like where was the, where was the I'm 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 getting my MBA, I'm in the server farm, and then when the next day you go, you know what, T, Bing. So I wish it was a Bing. It was that <laughs> slow dimmer light that you slide up real real <laughs> slow. The first time I had the thought of what I'm doing is stupid it was in college. I was working at Best Buy. Mm-hmm. And one day I was just, you know, tired from exams, looked around, said nothing in this store is necessary. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I'm, you know, everything in this store is pointless. You know, it doesn't improve anyone's life really. Right. It's, just, it's just terrible, right? So I was there. I was like, okay, this isn't for me. I'm not, I'm not really a tech guy. But unfortunately, when I graduated college, tech was the rage, right? right. So I went from one tech to another tech. Uh-huh. And, you know, I bounced around from actual IT and server farms <laughs> to doing digital marketing or helping create Alumni Roundup, the greatest social network that ever lived. Um, but even though I was good at it, it didn't feel fulfilling. Mm-hmm. So when I thought about what fulfills me, it was I want something that's tangible and that helps people. I don't want to sell liquor, right? right? Even though I'd probably be good at it, and people enjoy it. It's easy. It doesn't make people better. Right. And I need that for my for my personal fulfillment. Mm-hmm. So then how did you connect the dots? Okay. Because you're at the tech spot. Right. How does that connect to, you know, how do you just not become a barber or a <laughs> foot masseuse? Good question. Right. All right. So uh, also twofold. I, I wish it was a, clear, a, a quick, clear answer, but it, it's two. Um, I've been making my mom tea since pretty much I could reach the stove. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, thing I've drink in our family forever. Um, it's kind of risky in the kids over the hot water situation there. It was the we're 80s. Gonna, we're going to talk to Linda about that. We, they didn't have like child services back then or <laughs> you no know, one knew the number. You know, you can Google it. So, you know, it was less likely to get, you know, <laughs> sense away for that. Um, that and um, I had a really big influence of Kung Fu movies mm-hmm. growing up. Mm-hmm. So there's just, uh, I've always had this nostalgia for like tea drinking and tea culture Mm -hmm. but i you know being that i grew up in the east coast of america there wasn't a lot of tea culture happening so as i just got older and got more curious and had the power of the university of the google Mm. um (laughs) i just started reading more about tea and realizing that you know as i started drinking more about drinking tea and teaching my friends more about tea that once i taught people about the benefits of tea and how it could taste good and how we're just making it wrong more people wanted to drink tea Right. So that was the light bulb moment of, ding, I can do something that I'm good at and be fulfilled at and help people all in the same thing. It's brought all my life together. All right, so here's the real one. Okay. Good. Is it real or is it hocus pocus? Can you become the White Lotus drinking tea or not? Well, I th- <laughs> <laughs> The White Lotus didn't become the White Lotus just drinking tea, right? right. It, was, it was a combination. Tea helped, right? <laughs> right. He, and he drank tea. Mm-hmm. But he also meditated and worked out mm-hmm. and ate right, right? The and there's a eunuch. Well, Are you willing to go that far? I mean, he, he moved it around. So right. he, he, that's, that's, that's level three. Yeah, <laughs> get out of here. That's not even level two you're talking about. He's talking about level one right now. But no, but really, it's, it's all based on a wellness lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, all those Buddhist monk guys, right? They drink tea before they meditate. Mm-hmm. They meditate. Mm-hmm. Then they work out for hours. They only eat, you know, fresh vegetables and the slightest of meats. Right. Right. They have their whole life is dedicated to being as perfect as they can every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, not just drinking tea is not one thing, right? Right. But drinking tea is, is a part of a perfect day. Right. Okay. So aside from becoming the White Lotus, mm-hmm. is are the benefits of tea real meaning 
Is it documented? Has it been researched? What are we What are we expecting? Like, what does take me to? I know nothing mm-hmm. to now. I know one thing. Right. Right. Is it real? Yes. All right. So it's been studied, documented, over and over again. Drinking tea will increase your antioxidants. Antioxidants kill free radicals, which makes you less prone to cancer, Mm -hmm. makes you healthier, makes you feel better, gives you more clarity. Mm -hmm. Tea does all that. But aside from that, it's not just about drinking something that's healthful. It's about what it replaces, right? If you're drinking tea that tastes pretty good, you're probably not drinking soda right now. You're not drinking... Or less at least. Right. Exactly. Like you're filling your day with better things instead of filling your day with... Things that are hurting you. Right. So that's also really important. So mm-hmm. it's not a cure-all, right? You're not going to drink one cup of green tea and then be able to, like, withstand Ebola. Right. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but over time, drinking tea will make you age slower, make you happier and healthier. And also, it will replace whatever damage you would have been doing to your body if you weren't drinking tea. Right. Got it. That's good. What about What about tea versus coffee? Not in the not in the medical stuff yet, or not in the research yet, because you may even know that stuff. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But in your personal choice, why did you choose tea over coffee? Because you could have just said, "Hey, man, everybody loves coffee, and I'm just going to do the the exquisite coffee bean, mm-hmm. and I'm going to sell the exquisite coffee bean." So two things: one, um, my palate doesn't like bitter very much. Mm-hmm. In order to make coffee not bitter, you have to add a ton of sugar to it, or milk, or you have to add things to it to make it not bitter. Mm-hmm. Some people love bitter, mm-hmm. and that's why I can do black coffee. I, I can't do it. Also, coffee hurts my stomach. So I'm not going to drink something because it's trendy if it doesn't taste good to me and hurts me physically. Right. So tea, um, if you brew it correctly, can be naturally sweet. You know, it, it, it helps you digest. It's the opposite effect. It, mm-hmm. it can coat the lining of your stomach, whereas coffee uh, takes away from the coating of your lining of your stomach. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't a hard choice. I understand that coffee is like the king of America. But around the world, coffee's a very, you know, it's a rare drink. So, like, coffee's baseball and tea is cricket? Uh, <laughs> maybe soccer? <laughs> Let's call it soccer, okay? <laughs> Cricket's still a little obscure. No, cricket's everywhere, man, yeah. everywhere the empire went. Right, right. You know? right. So, really? But soccer, I think, would be, or football, uh-huh. is, a, <laughs> right, right. is a better analogy. Uh, yeah, like, baseball is really popular in America, <laughs> but if you go somewhere outside of America, who, you know, don't they don't have... You know, they can't afford bats and balls and large stadiums and leather gloves. Right. Then a, you know, a football in the field or a soccer ball in a field, mm-hmm. everyone can afford that. Right. It's a unifier. Right. Um, with tea, all you need is leaves and hot water, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have a bunch of gadgets to make it easier and cooler and make it more perfect. But if you go to many poor places in the world, they have a cup, hot water, leaves, and something to strain it with like a lid. And that's what they use all day. So is tea the electric car? I mean, is it the thing that is really good for us that has been, like, you know, held back because of the great oil barons until they figured out how to <laughs> saddle the thing? Is is coffee, gasoline, and tea the electric car? I think, no. I think tea is the bicycle. I think it's a, I think it's a very basic means of transportation that mm-hmm. causes no problems in the world, mm-hmm. but it's just not always sexy. But it's consistent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you Not every community can afford to have cars. Everyone can get a bike. Now, there are different kinds of bikes, right? There's the Diamondback BMX bike, and there's a Schwinn bike, <laughs> mm-hmm. and there's a whole bunch of, you know, now they have electric bikes, right? And they have some electric tea kettles that are really fancy. Right. But it's the democratization of a drink. Right. You could have it as uh, simple as you want it. You know, you could have some wheels and a bar and a steering wheel. That's technically a bike. Right. Or you could have something real fancy that's made by Volvo that right. you can use for, like, um, uh, the Grand Prix, however, you know, whatever that big race is. So, I don't know what the name of the race is. Tour de France? You're talking Tour de France. Right, yeah. Go. Can I have some more tea? Oh, yes. <clears throat> what is... You're from Brooklyn. And I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek because mm-hmm. you are from Brooklyn, but you're also, you know, you've been, you've lived other places. Yeah. Born in Canarsie. You, you, okay, you're born in Canarsie. Home of the brave. You should have gone to the mechanic in Canarsie when I told you to, but you didn't. We're going to keep that moving. I still have that problem, so I will now. Yes, yes. Okay, so... You're from Brooklyn. You're finally back in Brooklyn. Yes. You had some pretty good advice to get you to Brooklyn, I might add. wonder yep. how they got that. Right. Yeah. I think maybe my mom said something. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't recall. It's, someone said something about Park Slope a long time ago. I don't remember. Right, you're back in Brooklyn. Uh-huh. And now you're pursuing, you're still working uh, tech, mm-hmm. and this is your passion project that you're hoping 
will make a change in not only your life, but in your, your neighborhood mm -hmm. and in your borough and in your city. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, so what does that change? What do, you, what do you hope to see? If I pushed you out 15 years, are you just another tea company that, that you know, sells tea like Lipton mm -hmm. or uh, are you Yogi Tea or are you something different? Definitely something different. Um, Yogi Tea is great. And I'm I'm glad they're in stores. I'm glad they're getting people to try different teas. Um, Lipton is a staple in American culture. I'm glad they exist, right? Because mm -hmm. people wouldn't be drinking tea they're at helping all you out, if right? it wasn't Lipton, right? right. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know most people wouldn't know tea at all, right? If it wasn't for Lipton, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they're great, but they're different. They are uh, they're McDonald's. Um, they are it's uh, it's called CTC. It's the way they make their tea. So and they make their tea. So all their teas are exactly the same. I mean, you get a bag of Lipton tea, it tastes exactly like every other bag of Lipton tea you've ever had. Um, just like kind of like hamburger meat. If you go to McDonald's, every McDonald's across the country tastes exactly the same. Um, in order to get that consistency, you lose some things. You lose some flavor. You lose some of the nuances of tea, but it's consistent, which mm -hmm. is good for a, a huge global brand. I never want to do that. I, I want to keep it to a place where it's always the loose leaf aroma the experience of it i think the experience of it is just as important as the to tea itself mm -hmm. and you lose that when you go to commercial but you know i wanted to spread i wanted to be global i want to be worldwide but i think we can do both at the same time like some other you know luxury brands have done right what about the block what's the change in the block what do you what do you, what do you want to see differently Locally. in your hyper local experience mm -hmm. well I mean, people work and people do what's in their neighborhood mostly, right? Mm -hmm. um, you might be on the internet shopping, but you also walk by on the way to the train or just walking to your car, uh, wherever the neighborhood store is. And the neighborhood store could be a liquor store or it could be a pawn shop or it could be a tea place or a wellness center or a host of other things. By having Brooklyn Tea, especially the brick and mortar form of it, um, I'm giving the neighborhood the opportunity to w experience something that they may not have otherwise. You can work in a tea shop instead of working, you know, at a coffee, a, a soulless corporation. Mm -hmm. You can learn about something that may help your family. Um, if, you know, some herbal teas have medicinal properties and maybe your grandma is ailing for something and instead of her taking a thousand pills by working at my tea shop, you can learn, okay, hey, grandma, Try this. This mm -hmm. might help you out a little bit that you wouldn't have gotten that education otherwise. Right. So by by teaching and by just being there and asking, answering questions and being a local guide about something that that's healthy and worldwide that most local people don't know about, I can help that community um, just be better. Okay. So your your mother is from the Caribbean. Yes, Jamaica. <laughs> Like a Wait, do that one more time, please. You got to do it every time. <laughs> do you do the bogle hands when you do it every time? Yeah. I, I just lit a lighter. <laughs> Is there a soccer horn? Do you have a, do you at home have a mesh tank top? Um, not even more. <laughs> I, I outgrew it a little bit, but I do have the soccer horn on the desktop of my computer. And I, I do play it from time to time when someone makes a funny. <laughs> yeah, so it's just something crazy in the house. I, pr I press the button. <laughs> so talk about T. From her perspective, because like in the Caribbean, my experience is tea is like the elixir of God. It is like the cure-all. You could have anything from hangnail to, you know, serious, serious, you know, blood ailment. And tea is going to be, it's already here in the Western Hemisphere. So what what was your, what's your mother's voice in this whole thing? Okay, so let's, let's talk about three teas in my house, right? The first tea is going to just be regular black tea. Then we're going to talk about sorrel. And then we're going to talk about sericey. I didn't know sorrel was tea. Yeah, sorrel is hibiscus tea. Okay, so right? I drank sorrel, but I never knew it was... Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, it's hibiscus tea. Mm. All right, so black tea. Black tea is what you drink in the morning. Right. That's it. There's no, there's no thought process to it. When you wake up, you make black tea, okay. and that's how your day starts. All right. That's the routine. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. There's no thinking about it. There's no questioning it. <laughs> that's just it. Right. Is you wake up, you, you start making black tea. Right. That's it. Right? <laughs> Um, and this happened your whole childhood? Entire life. Still happens. Okay. Oh, I was home for Christmas. Um, my mom says, you want some tea? I was like, I'll make it right now. It just, it just kicked in. It's right. like a mentoring candidate. She said the magic word <laughs> with the action. Just before you, before you go further with the, what the other two teas do and everything, has she commented at all on the quality of your tea-making skill? 
No, <laughs> my mom does not appreciate in any way that I have learned way more about tea and that I can make it, you know, differently. Right. Um, she, she now she drinks my tea, but she drinks the same version of like she drinks an Assam, which is pretty much English breakfast tea mm-hmm. that she's been drinking her whole life. Okay. She doesn't try any different kinds of tea. Right. She just wants the better version or my version of the tea that she drinks. Right. She doesn't care about pu'ers or hojitas. But what about, what about your, you know, knowing how long it should steep now, knowing the proper temperatures and all the things you do that you do now that you didn't do then, that doesn't matter. Also doesn't matter. Okay. She'll drink it if I do it correctly, <laughs> quote unquote correctly, but she also won't do it correctly herself. Right. Because she never has and she doesn't care. Okay. She's just getting it done. <laughs> yep. Okay. English breakfast tea, Got steep, it. burnt to a crisp. Okay. It's what she wants. Got it. So fine. Yeah. So I, there's, you wake up in the morning, you have black tea. That's it. Now yep. what else? All right. So then, um, and, so there's sorrel. Right, which is a sweetened, tasty drink that sometimes you add rum to. Right, mm-hmm. it's the fun drink. Right? right, it's it has medicinal properties because hibiscus is really good for you. It has high antioxidants. Mm-hmm. But that's not why you drink it. You drink because it, it tastes good. It's our fruit punch, basically. Okay, it's the all-purpose good drink. Mm-hmm. Then there's cerise. Cerise is gross. It's bitter. It's from the bitter melon um, plant. It is the cure all. It cures everything. It's called cleaning your blood. Right, if you are sick. <laughs> If you're hurt, if you have a poison ivy, <laughs> drink some Cerise, it cleans your if blood. you stubbed your toe. Right. right. Drink some Cerise, it cleans your blood. Mm. That's the whole phrase. Mm. Um, I don't know if it works. Uh, they, they have done, um, they've done some research on it, and they said it, like, it actually does work. It can lower blood pressure. It can lower blood sugar. Um, it's, an all, it's an amazing plant. Right. But I don't know if it cures... All the things they say it cures. Right. I don't know if it stops poison ivy, but it might because it. I mean, maybe lowering blood pressure and lowering blood sugar is what you need to cure poison ivy. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Okay. But but your mom has all three of these in her house right now. At all times since I've been born. Got it. Does she actually drink Cersei? No, it's for sickness. Okay, so if she gets sick, then what about your dad? Does he does he subscribe to this stuff? Like, so if he gets sick, is he going to take the Cersei that she makes? By yeah, no choice. Okay. Yeah, everyone drinks Cersei when they're sick. That's what you do with the household. You, the, now, in your own house, do you do it? I have Cersei in the house, yes. But when you get sick, do you actually take it? When I get the little tickle in the back of my throat, I drink mm-hmm. Cersei. And a lot of times it works begrudgingly. But like I said, it's really bitter, and I don't have a good bitter palate. Right. So it's really, I mean, I, I can't, it's unsweetenable. It's just really mm. bitter, but it seems to work. Okay. <laughs> so, will you sell Cersei in Brooklyn Tea? I might have some in the back in case someone asks for it. You might. Because it really does work, right? Can you get high-quality Cersei and high-quality, uh, what's the other one? The high business? Sorrel. Sorrel, yeah. Yeah, so you can get a, so you can get a high, high-quality sorrel. Um, it's just uh, the West African hibiscus plant. Mm-hmm. Of course, the you know, slave trade African diaspora. Um, so hibiscus came with the slaves, and they planted it where they were, which is a tropical climate. Right. And boom, sorrel. Um I mean, I drink sorrel all the time still. I still drink a lot of sorrel. Well, in a, such a, I mean, I know we have gentrification going on. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a reality. It's happened already. It continues to happen. The edge is being pushed mm-hmm. in Brooklyn that, you know, is predominantly in historically, you know, black borough with a mix of people from all around the world, a lot of Caribbean peoples. Mm-hmm. To be the brand Brooklyn Tea, do you still speak to the, the pre- gentrification roots Brooklyn as well as new Brooklyn I mean so in that sense do you carry sorrel should you I don't know well it depends um so right now where you know where Brooklyn where Brooklyn tea uh where I am as Brooklyn tea um I wouldn't need to carry Cerise and sorrel because they already got it now still still a lot of West West Indian places there and I wouldn't want to compete with them okay right if you like right I live two stores down from a West Indian grocery store Mm -hmm. it's called a West Indian grocery store they have sorrel they have Cerisee, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't want to price them out, right? But if they go away because of gentrification, then that means I need to pick up that, that torch and carry that around because the neighborhood should, still should have a place that keeps that. Right. So right now I wouldn't. Mm. But in the future, if you know, the trend keeps going, then I'll carry everything that you know, from my roots to what the neighborhood wants. Well, what about the guy? What about the West Indian man in Cleveland? Maybe he should be able to buy it online. Right, but it's true. So, if that's the case, and I see a demand for it, 
um, then I'll, I'll I'll stock it for online purchases. Online only. Online right. only. Right. right. But I won't sell in the neighborhood because if you come in my place and ask me if I if you have if I have sorrel, if I have Cerisee, I'm like, no, go two doors down. They have it. They're they're great. Right. Because I'm still part of a neighborhood community. Right. Okay. So I'm taking you back again, mm-hmm. and you've you're you're in your tech gig. You decide tease the deal. Mm-hmm. What moves do you make to qualify yourself to? I mean, do you just read books on tea? That's part of it. I did read a lot. I read a lot of books on tea. Um, I watched a lot of tea documentaries, mm-hmm. and then I got certified as a tea sommelier from the International Tea Masters Association. Mm-hmm. So I took a class, cost a, cost a pretty penny, mm-hmm. and I got certified over, I think, 10 weeks of about being able to serve tea properly. Right. So the next level of that is being a tea master. So it's another pretty penny. I have to fly out to the West Coast because it's the only place they have in America. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I get certified again to be a tea master, which is pretty much the highest level of tea expert you can be. Right. Okay. You think you might do it? In your, uh, it's in your, in your plan at some point? 2018 October. Oh, wow. You're already on it. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's the next step. All right. So how do you, how do you plan, you think... To approach the coffee drinker, or do you not? Do you just approach the tea drinker and just... Actually, I'm glad you said that. All right, so smell this. Here, are you, do you drink coffee? Yeah. Okay. This is, is it, this is familiar. What is this? Does it remind you of flavored coffee? So it's caramel puer. I'll tell you what it reminds me of. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of pipe tobacco, a really sweet pipe tobacco. That's, you have a good nose, man. Mm. All right, so this is fermented black tea. Yes. It has the tobacco, leathery smell to it. Yeah. When you brew it... It's dark and malty. Mm-hmm. It has a um, a sweet taste to it, mm-hmm. like a flavored coffee. So usually, if someone is a avid coffee drinker and wants to get off tea for either health reasons or just you know because of the jitters or whatever whatever reason they want to get off coffee, I usually say try that one first. Okay, because it's the most light coffee. It's malty. It's a little bit thick. It's you know it has that smoky flavor, also with the sweet caramel. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the Easiest bridge between being a avid coffee drinker and a tea drinker at all. Right. Usually, those people who have that that palate for coffee, they go for the darker, more you know, more astringent teas first, mm-hmm. and maybe branch out to other things, or maybe just stay there at the black black teas because they're the closest to coffee. Right. Um, I don't want someone to, who drinks coffee all day to go to something like Essentia, which is a light green, not so easy to make mm-hmm. tea. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas you do a puer, it's hard to mess it up. It's um, if you steep it for three minutes or ten minutes, pretty much the same flavor comes out of it. Right. So you know, it's it's like uh, Fisher Price, my first tea. Okay. You know what was funny is mm-hmm. um, what were the first two teas from your brand that I had at home? The first two, I think one was Relax Rate Release, right? Which is a caramel lemongrass based tea, mm-hmm. good for relaxation and lowering blood pressure. And the second one, I'm assuming, because of what you do for a living, was Better Body Oolong. Probably. Yeah. Right. Now, I took these home, and I brewed them, Mm -hmm. because I have a daily green tea habit. Right. And uh, they were good. You know, I enjoy them. I drink them every day. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? And then I got home the Kyoto Cherry Rose Sencha, Mm -hmm. and that was a game changer. Right. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened, and this is, there's going to be some culture in here, right? <laughs> so this isn't for everybody, mm-hmm. but this is the deal. I was over at my mother's house for the holiday, my parents' house, and I opened it up, and I smelled it, and I was like, wow, this smells great. I gave it to my mom to smell it, and she says, I know that smell. I was like, okay, what does it smell like? It smells just like Jergens lotion. <laughs> <laughs> and then I smelled it again, and she's right. There must be a, like... A, Cherry Rose Jergens lotion. There must be. There's got uh-huh. to be. Gotta be. Yeah. And it's the winter time, so it's fresh. So <laughs> and as soon as I tasted this tea, mm-hmm. first of all, I smelled it. My mom smelled it. My daughter smelled it. I brewed it. And we let it sit because it was really hot. It's like a 10-minute steep, right? And then... I drank it, daughter drank it, and I immediately got you on the phone. Mm-hmm. I was like, dog, first of all, you've been holding out. <laughs> this is the better, in my opinion, my humble opinion, mm-hmm. of all three that I've tasted, this is the one. This is like 
game changer T. Mm-hmm. And you told me that for some reason that I was wrong. Or what did you say? What did you say? I said that different people have different tastes. Yeah, but no, this is clearly better. <laughs> <laughs> right. So for right. So you that's 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 for you, right? Um for me, there's the uh there's oolongs. I love oolongs. Mm-hmm. I drink oolongs every single day. Every I mean, my my Jamaican wake up English breakfast tea right. is oolong. Right. Okay. You wake up, you have a oolong. That's mm-hmm. that's my life. Um for you it's the cherry rose sencha. Mm-hmm. So the beauty of tea is there's so many of them that you don't have to have a supreme, right? Right. Uh, maybe you like Pinot Noirs, right? uh-huh. <laughs> maybe you like Moscato. <laughs> That's your business, right? Well, the other thing that you said that was interesting was that you know for years I've been drinking Sencha, mm-hmm. and Sencha is to me, I've screwed it up enough times to know how to do it now, right? right? So where I used to like just grin and bear it. And be like, okay, this is what I got to do to prevent cancer. I'll do this, right? But then come to find out, I'm oversteeping this stuff, and mm-hmm. it's just like super bitter going down. To now, I'm like, I'm perfect. I can do it. And my, my eyes closed. It's delicious. It's great. I keep it iced. I drink it hot. Whatever. Mm-hmm. And now to get the cherry rose piece, it was like, wait a minute. Wow, this is this is a take on the thing over one of my fan favorites already. Right. This is great. Exactly. And mm-hmm. that's the point, right? It's you added some um, rose hips, some rose petals, and a little bit of cherry. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, natural extract to this tea, and it's a whole different tea now, right? Mm-hmm. It's a whole different flavor, mm-hmm. and it's light and it's elegant and delicate, but it's also super fragrant, has a great aroma, and you know, it's it's a great tea, right? Um, I mean, and it it just for you and for your palate, it works. This is you know, but for someone else who wants something strong and smoky, or someone else who wants something you know fruity, we have that too, right? Because right. I'm not here to say what's best. I'm here to give you whatever it is you want. Right. So how has the, re- the reception been? I mean, everybody's had tea at some point in time. Mm-hmm. And it, pardon me, because I'm looking up something that I want to re- reference uh, while we're talking. Okay. But so I, everybody's had tea, mm-hmm. you know. And so now you've had a couple tastings. You've participated in, in, in uh, a couple events here and there. And you got a big one coming up in March. What is the reception from people not even in general. If you can, mm-hmm. if you've heard reference from other tea, existing tea drinkers and people who might not be as, you know, as much a tea fan, what are they telling you? What so, are the ups and downs? Give me like some pros and cons or what are you hearing? So I skipped the part from um, your earlier question. Mm. Um, I, when you asked me about what, my, uh, what I did to become experienced in tea, mm-hmm. I skipped the part of I worked at a tea shop nights and weekends for over a year while I was working my full-time job. And that's where a lot of the testing happened. Okay. Um, I watch people drink different kinds of tea. I watch, uh, you know, I watch people order a pot for two, and one person say, "This is the best thing I've ever had in my life," and one person say, "This is gross." <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I've I've seen it happen in person to know um, a few things. One is that you know, when someone's opinion isn't directly uh, at you, it's what they think about this product, right. and. You can say, you know, if someone says, I don't like this, they're not saying I don't like you. They're saying this doesn't meet my, you know, what my palate likes. So, you know, I know I, I pick the highest quality teas that are available. So when someone says that, it's not like my tea is bad. It's this flavor wasn't right for this person. Right. So I find a different flavor. I ask them questions like, what do you usually drink? What do you like to eat? Mm-hmm. Like, what, do you, what kind of, what's your favorite smell? Right. And then from that, you get a profile of this person and what they, what they tend to gra- gravitate towards. Um, so, so far, with that knowledge, when I talk to people before they drink or while they're drinking, if they drink and they love it, I say, okay, here's some other things like this that you might like. If they drink and they make a frowny face, I'm like, okay, you had this one that's kind of dark and malty. Try this up on the other side of the world that's mm-hmm. like light and fruity. Right. Um, and then like, if they don't like that, like, okay, I got something in the middle. Let's try this oolong. It's my favorite. It's kind of warm and toasty. Right. right? So, yeah, if they don't like that, they're like, okay, man, you don't like tea. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to get back here and wash these dishes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, this, this, is, this ain't for you, man. What about when you did your, I've seen pictures from your events where you have uh, the canisters, the different teas, the little smell containers, mm-hmm. and the, like, candlelit warmers. Yeah. Uh, so, when people have the opportunity to, to taste and smell an array of teas, mm-hmm. what have you found? So, it's, it's pretty cool. Um so your your smell and your taste are linked, right? The olfactory system, mm. um, and you'll see people look at the tea, smell it, think about it, and smell it again. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a thing that happens. 
um, the cherry rose that you love, uh, when people smell that, they're so pleasantly surprised. Right. Because they look at it, it doesn't look like much, right? It looks like some rose petals and some green tea. Right. You smell it, it's like, you know, a whole world of smells. It's complex smells. Mm -hmm. There's some sweet, some floral in there. It's, it's just a bunch of things happening. Um, so people tend to like that. Or some, some people, that's too sweet for them. They'll go, they'll, they'll smell and they'll go, ugh. And right. they'll be repulsed by it. Mm. And they'll go smell something that's like a plain green gunpowder tea, which is like pure ancient style tea. And they'll go, oh, this is great. Right. So I have that large array. And there's 30 teas usually in that array. So people can go down the line and smell different kinds of teas, some flavored, some unflavored, um, from white all the way to black, and get a sense of one, what they like. Do you arrange them in that order? Like, you no. know. Okay. Um, I purposely mix them up to the best of my ability. Sometimes just mentally, mm -hmm. I'll, put, I'll start putting them in orders, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> because, you know, working at a tea shop for so long that th th there is an order that they, c they can go in from right. most oxidized to least oxidized. Mm -hmm. And that's usually when you build a tea wall, that's what you do. You go from highly oxidized to herbal, okay. basically. Um, or you can do it by steeping times as well. But anyway, but um, so I try to mix them up. Um, I try to do some different flavors together and like some ones that don't have a strong flavor a strong smell I should say with some that have a strong smell just so to you get you get like a brain break um, Febreze used this term very well of going nose blind mm -hmm. it's a real thing right if you keep smelling sweet then something that's a little sweet doesn't smell sweet at all to you right right so if you smell sweet then you smell something bitter and something like floral your senses get a chance to re recycle and repeat right and then um, you know you can smell more things. Right. Have you found that there's a, uh, is there any data yet that shows you the, this, the leanings of people or of, of leanings of, let's say, gender? As, or do the females like versus men like? Or do older people like versus young people like different types? No. I think people like what they're used to in mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. So if you, I think it might be cultural. If you're from a culture where like, like a lot of smoky meats, you like a lot of smoky teas. Mm -hmm. Or um, if you're from a culture um, that's used to sweet, fruity things, then sweet, fruity tea is what you gravitate towards. Right. Um, I don't think it's gender-based. Um, I've had men and women like Rose. I've had men and women like uh, like a Lapsang Sushang, which is a super, it smells like a campfire, basically. Right. So the thing that I was looking up was um, the reason for me that, I mean, I was already a tea drinker, you mm -hmm. know, here and there, but... Not historically. Like, you know, I started drinking coffee in college. Mm -hmm. Not for the reason for drinking great coffee. It was for staying up because yeah. I was an engineer and I had to stay up. Right. Um, and no those wasn't the way I was going. And so that turned into just a, a habit. And then, you know, tea kind of was an outlier for me. Right. But the game changer on tea was a TED Talk by William Lee. Who, and I've referenced this talk. I've sent it to family. I've sent it to friends. It is one of maybe five TED Talks that I will watch again and again, and I'll learn something again. Mm -hmm. But that particular one, the, the title of it was Can We Starve Cancer? Mm -hmm. And this is a PhD who's doing research on you know why cancer grows, uh, what sustains it, you know, his, his, in his explanation, we all have cancer cells in our body. You know, they're just typically the size of a, the, the tip of a pencil. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference becomes, are they being nourished or not? Right. And so in, in this TED Talk, and I, and I think everybody should check it out, it's William Lee, L.I., Can We Starve Cancer, uh, from 2010. He talks about, as I talk about often, upstreaming the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've already broken the vase, all you can do is glue it, tape it back together. You know, right. but if you can prevent the vase from breaking, it's, your your life is, is is completely different, and everything's completely different. Right. So, what he talks about in that is the power of two teas. He talks about sencha, which is why I'm a sencha drinker, mm -hmm. and he talks about I think Dragon Pro Oolong, okay. and and in that combination of those two, how his research shows that it prevents cancer cells from developing the blood flows that supply their growth. Interesting. And that's, that's a game changer for me. Yeah. That's a life changer for me. It, and what's funny is it goes deeper than that because as I started drinking more tea, I, you know, your teeth go from like pearly white to like now, you know, like you used to stain tea parchment back in like fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Eventually you get some coloring. And I, I, I don't like that, you know. Um, 
So I remember calling a dentist friend of mine, uh, Enrique Matabar. He's in Washington, D.C. And uh, I said, Enrique, you know, um, there's, t- there's, there's, there's whitening work. And what am I, what should I expect? And he told me, hey, man, you should expect that you're going to get some sensitivity, you know, and, and things like that. But he said, the thing to do really is to stop drinking dark liquids. And my answer was like, I can't do that. Like this, the cost is worth the, <laughs> yeah, it's worth the penalty. You know, the value is worth the penalty in that case. So if I have a chance to prevent getting cancer or at least take me from a 30% pr- probability to a less than 30% probability mm-hmm. and I got to suffer a little tooth browning, shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> So those two T's are the are two that are always somewhere near and dear to me, Dragon Pro Oolong and and uh, Sencha. Yeah. Well, those are great T's. And when you said something about teeth, uh, teeth mm. browning, so there's a T for that. Uh, <laughs> silver needle white tea. Okay. Um, has been clinically proven to actually white, help you whiten and strengthen your teeth. Oh wow! So you know, silver needle tea. Uh, it's expensive. Okay. It's one of the most expensive teas, mm. but it's also delicious. It's um, you steep it a lot like sencha, mm-hmm. maybe a minute or so. Right. It's sweet <clears throat> naturally. It's white. It's the buds of the plant, mm-hmm. and it helps whiten teeth. And I, it's not marketing. That's real. Yeah, it's real. I can send you. I can uh, send you the actual <laughs> researcher okay. who doesn't know me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that did the research. It didn't do for Colgate, right? Because you know <laughs> the foul that you know it actually helps to whiten your and strengthen your teeth. Hmm. Well, there that is. So tea fixes the tea problems, right? There you go. <laughs> um, it's interesting. This Dragon Pearl, like, he was very specific with the Dragon Pearl log. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to rewatch that TED talk to see yeah. if he gave you a reason why it's Dragon Pearl specifically. Right. Um, Dragon Pearl is rolled. It's mm-hmm. a very tight ball of uh, oxidized tea leaf. Uh, it's really good too. It's also a little bit pricey. Um, I don't know what process makes it um, help with th- that specific kind of cancer, mm-hmm. but it's interesting to know that that combination because he's a researcher and he's on a TED talk means he's smarter than the rest of us. Not TEDx either. Yeah. TED. Or, yeah. Right. So you know, it means he's smarter than me because I've never done a TED talk. Right. So I'm, I, I believe him. Right. And um, yeah. So start. Believe him. Do yeah. what you got to do. <laughs> and it's interesting, yeah, because I, I hear, and I didn't know that they were genetically the same plant until mm-hmm. you said. So, right, the 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 pearl teas they're rolled mm-hmm. like that, balled up like little marbles, and so I wonder why also. But the thing that was that was interesting was he showed the stats for this oolong, mm-hmm. and this was the the help that it did, and he showed the stats for the senja, but the combination of the two, well, you know, they got the synergy there, yeah. so it was greater than some of its parts. So, all right, so you know my brain's flowing now, so mm. it's uh might be the hojicha happening. So when you the reason one of the reasons why the different flavors happen when they process the teas differently is the chemical bonds are broken in different ways based on the way you heat and um, roll or twist the tea. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking that um, by processing them differently, they're releasing different levels of antioxidants, mm-hmm. and different antioxidants are flavonoids. So it's possible that. Sencha has this, you know, this certain set, you know, certain combination, almost like a Rubik's Cube of antioxidants that it it uh, produces mm-hmm. because of the way it's processed. And so is every other tea. So he must have found through his research that this Rubik's Cube plus that Rubik's Cube blocks cancer. Right. Right. And that's the deal. Yeah. That's the game changer. Yeah. So I think you're doing, you know, the right thing. I think it's fantastic having seen, you know, where you started to the work that you've put in, to now kind of determining your fate and deciding where this thing will go and how it will grow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love the fact that it's, uh, I love the fact that Brooklyn is a magical place. It's got a place in my heart, you know. Um, it's not just, not just media Brooklyn. It is, it's, you know, it's, it's a second home, yeah. you know. Um, and it comes with the people. And uh, so I'm excited to see what can, what can happen. Right, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's also cool, and um, I was, you know, talking to Jamila, the girlfriend, about this the other day. Uh, we we both did alumni roundup together, and you went immediately to alumni fitness, and then eating for abs. Mm-hmm. I took a little bit of a, a circumvent approach, you know, it mm-hmm. takes me a little longer sometimes. And uh, eventually, I got into the wellness game as well. Mm-hmm. And we also have a mutual friend, Light, who went directly to right. you know wellness and yoga and meditation. And it's good that as we grow. We're all still kind of on the same page, and we all can have, you know, long conversations about health and wellness because mm-hmm. that's 
our interests haven't changed, right? Right. We're still interested in the same things. We're just doing it different ways than we were right. 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, what I've learned from actually technology was when your friends are in technology and you're in technology, you learn way more than everybody else because all your conversations, even when you're out drinking, somehow go back to technology, right? right. If, you know, if, you're, if you have this certification, your boy got the certification, you guys could be having a beer, but you're still <laughs> talking shop. Right. So now that, you know, we have this small community of wellness people, you know, even when I'm going out with a friend like uh, our boy Zobi, mm -hmm. we talk about philosophy and we talk about tea, right? right? Because he's in that wellness sphere. Right. So it's been good to, you know, have friends who are focused on wellness and to keep by find more friends who are focused on wellness because then, you know, instead of most of my day being on Real Housewives, it's, <laughs> it, we're, we're all talking about getting better and being better and getting other people better. It also comes with that several disagreements as well, which That's is part of the process. process yeah. <laughs> um, like I said, I love philosophy, and I believe one of, the, <laughs> one of the famous sayings is, if two people agree, one is not necessary. Right. <laughs> right. And right. so arguing about things and disagreeing about things, you know, with a good point to it. Right. Makes both of you better.